I'm almost over. Pick it up what the Holy Spirit is laying down. Now that's a title right there. Galatians chapter 5. Let's all stand together as we read God's Word this morning. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to His cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, God, so much for many blessings. And God, we do thank you for this wonderful time of worship that we've had this morning. We hope... And pray, Lord, that it was pleasing to you, uh, God, as we offered it up as an offering. We pray and thank you so much for Jonathan and our band. And we thank you, God, for just every facet of that. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us from your word. God, uh, may this become a part of our, our hard drive. May it become a part of our thinking, God, as we live our daily lives. Be with us. Help us to understand your word. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, what does the text say? There's three things that matter in interpretation. They are, number one, context. Number two, context. You may want to know what number three is? That would be context all over again. So uh, what is the context for our text? Well, Paul has been talking about the two natures and the battle that goes on in our hearts and minds with these two natures. The one nature is the, is the flesh. It's our, it's our human nature that we're born with. Uh, it's, it's pretty sorry at times. You understand that? As a matter of fact, we characterized it last week when we talked about the works of the flesh. I love our text where it talks to us about, uh, about nailing to the cross the works of the flesh. In other words, this, this, this old man within us, that that lingers within us, we are to... Uh, we are to nail that to hey, uh, we are to nail that sheep on my finger. So we, we need to nail that to the cross. And uh, so what we have is is that you know we're we're to we're to to let that die. And I, I love the, the King James version that said uh, in another place saw mortify the works of the flesh. I love that word. I've always loved it. Mortify. What does it mean? It means to kill something dead, dead, dead. Y'all understand that? There was a sheriff out in Arizona. He understood it. What happened was that somebody went out and, uh, and murdered one of his deputies. Basically just an execution. And so he and his deputies went out to go find this guy. And when they found the perpetrator, they shot him 57 times. The media went to him and asked him about that. I see some looks. And we had asked him, good grief, why in the world did you shoot this guy 57 times? To which the sheriff said, we did not have 58 bullets. <laughs> now, I don't know what all went on with that, what went up, what went down, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this. That uh, uh, you need to take the works of the flesh and kill them dead, dead, dead even if it takes 58 bullets, all right? need to mortify the works of the flesh. And then the other side of it. You know, and I keep saying that the best illustration of the two natures dueling back and forth is the old-timey cartoons. Now, I know that the new cartoons are Phineas and Ferb and SpongeBob SquarePants and walking, talking, french fries and milkshakes and all kinds of ignorance, I-G-N-E-R-T, ignorant stuff. I get that. But some of us remember the days of Papa Smurf and He-Man and some of the good cartoons. And some of us remember Bugs Bunny and the Road Runner. Amen? Amen. You know what I'm talking about? Falling off the cliff once again, right? Well, back in that day, they used to have the main character. Every time he would get into a moral dilemma... The cartoon would show a little angel on one side and a little devil on the other. Remember that? And the angel would be telling the main character to do the right thing. And the demon, of course, would always be saying, do the wrong thing. Well, the fact is that you really have that reality going on in your spiritual life. Every day of your life, your new 
nature, which is Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, in your heart, telling you what's right, guiding you, directing you, battling the old nature, the temptations of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, and these things are battling each other, not just once in a while, but all day, every day. And you, as one in charge of you, have to decide, not only for a lifetime, but daily. What are you going to do about that? And our, which nature are you going to listen to in that moment or with that decision? Well, we receive the Holy Spirit when we are saved. He is the down payment. He is the uh, first down payment of what God has given us and what He is going to give us. He comes into our lives to convict us of sins, convince us of righteousness and of judgment to come. Well, not only that, but on a regular basis, as we yield ourselves to Him, and as we have need, not only are we indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so it's how much of us that we yield to the Holy Spirit. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit produces fruit in our lives. He produces holiness by producing fruit. He begins to grow fruit in our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. I want you to think about an orchard. Now, whatever your favorite fruit is. You know, I, uh, you know, I, th I think about oranges or I think about, I love bananas. I eat bananas every day. To think about an orchard with fruit growing in it. And think about how that, that might be harvested. As people go through, if they have mechanical harvesters, they're probably shaking trees and bumping trees and, and then others are gathering the fruit in baskets and so forth. Well, here's the deal. If you want to know who you are in that picture, as the Holy Spirit produces fruit in your life, you're the dude with the basket. You're the lady with the basket. And you're there and you're only going to catch what you're trying to catch. And you're only going to gather up what you're willing to receive. And so the Holy Spirit wants to produce fruit in your life, and you should want that for your life. Now, we couldn't have a nine-point sermon, amen? Amen. And yeah, we could, if y'all want to go there. You ain't going to beat nobody to the restaurant that way. Uh, all of them are going to get there first. So, you know, we're going to do three today, and we're going to do the other six, probably in increments of three, and it's some other time. But love, joy, peace. Those are the three first three fruits of the Spirit, and we're going to talk about them today. Love. It's no wonder. It's so basic to our faith, it's no wonder that it starts out first. As a matter of fact, in 1 John 4, 8, love is synonymous for God. God is love. If you want to know what God is, if you want to know how He acts, He operates in a, in a mode of love. He is love. He loved the world so much He sent His one and only Son. The great commandment says... You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and all the demands of the prophets, everything else but Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastics, Psalms, Psalms, is this teaching. The entire law and the demands, the whole Old Testament, are based on these two commandments. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor. I mean, that, that's it. That sums it up. Love God and love other people. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, love your enemies even, Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you've heard it said by them of old time. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. That's radical, isn't it? Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, who makes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and send its rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them that love you, what reward have you? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? The point he's making is if you're only going to love those who are like you, and if you're only going to love those that you agree with, if you're only going to love those who see it like you see it, then what's different about you than anybody else, than the world? They love each other like that at a bar. Yeah. It's been a while since I've been. But anyway, you know, I mean, you give somebody two or three shots or a couple of six packs of beer, and they love all over each other. <laughs> oh, you, 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 you know? That's the way that's going to go down, right? ISIS, they love one another enough to die for one another. You see? So, you know, what, what makes us different? Well, we're going to love our enemies. We're going to love those who are not like us. We're going to love those that, that it doesn't come natural to love. We're going to love those that do things wrong to us. That's where Jesus 
soon. We're going to excel. We're going to love God. We're going to love each other. We're going to love the lost. We're going to love other people. Well, the adversary, the devil, he says to us about this fruit of the Holy Spirit called love. Where's the love? As you look at your world today, how much love do you see in it? You know, I mean, you, you go and, you know, we're in the political season. And, uh, you know, not only do the Democrats hate the Republicans and the Republicans hate the Democrats, you got a whole lot of that going on. You kind of expect that. They hate each other, too. I mean, man, I, you know, this, you know, they, you, you find them talking about one another and, you know, uh, you know, Raising insults, Trump's insulting everybody, ain't he? I mean, he said that Carly Fiorina was ugly. Well, I mean, she can't help it that she looks like a weasel. <laughs> I ain't right to bring that kind of stuff up. That person can't say somebody's ugly. Come on, what's that got to do with anything? And, and Trump calling somebody ugly. <laughs> That is the worst hairdo on planet Earth. You know, thank God for the hats and say, make America great, amen? Cover up that ugly hair, son. You know? I mean, you know, there's people there, you, you look at the world, there's no love. There's people all the time taking their magical devices and taping what? Do they, do they take hugs and kisses? Well, I guess sometimes, once in a while, but most of the time they're videotaping Beatdowns. They're, they're, they're videoing uh, beatdowns on buses and classrooms and in front yards and in ball fields and that kind of stuff. People, you know, you see the opposite of love everywhere you go. So when Satan, the adversary, says, I don't see any love, what about your love that, that you people have? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what, the love that I see more often than any other is the love that God's people have for one another. I'm going to be in two revivals coming up. Now, I ain't going to miss any Sunday mornings. I'd be afraid I'd miss something. I'd miss y'all too bad. But as soon as I get through preaching next Sunday morning, I'm headed to Franklinton. And then the following Sunday, I'm headed to Farmerville to preach a revival. I love to preach revivals. I really do. And sometimes it re revival really breaks out. Sometimes, and we, and we see that. We're, we're, I'm, I'm starting to see it more and more. I just feel like that the Holy Spirit's moving in a lot of ways, and perhaps we could be in that time where we're about to get that, that show for our time. Uh, I, I see God moving. We, we did a revival down in Maryville. The first uh, service was Sunday morning. That's supposed to be the big one. They had about 100 people. And that night, they had about 125. And Monday night, they had about 25, 30 more. And then the next thing you know, the high school heard about it. And the students in Maryville High School, they they heard there was some crazy stuff and some fun stuff going on at Calvary Church. And so they started showing up. And by Wednesday night, the last night of the revival, there were 250 people there with standing room only. And we were out of time, man. People were getting saved. It was just good. And so when I go up to these revivals, I have high expectations and hope that things are going to go well. But here's what I know. And here's what I can guarantee you. Every time I go somewhere in revival, I get loved. And there's just something about it. There's just something about God's people. And you can be around people. You know, I'm only around people for, for a few hours, and it's mostly a monologue, right? I'm talking and they're listening. I'm not really getting to know them. I love this woman. She, she was uh, down in South Louisiana, and I preached a revival. And uh, one night I picked on the saints. Of course I don't want to do that. You know, and that's before they won the Super Bowl. That's back when they pretty much stunk. And, uh, you know, like the whole rest of the history. And so anyway, so, you know, I, I was picking on the saints one night. Then another night I talked about how I hated dogs. And then, and then another night I picked on Chevrolets. I, I was driving a Ford and I said, you know, Jesus was a Chevrolet man. He walked everywhere he went. And uh, so anyway, you know, I you know, did all these different things, you know. And so this lady, she, she tells me on the, floor, on the last night of the revival, hey, son, come over here. Come over here and sit down. I knew it wasn't going to be good. And so I sit down beside her, you know, and she puts her arm around me, but I knew that was, I, mean, I wasn't falling for that. You know, it's kind of like that demon-possessed dog, y'all got. Anyway, I wasn't falling for it. 
And so she says to me, she said, you know, you're against my football team. I love dogs and you don't like dogs. And, and you even talked about my car. You know, she said, uh, I just don't know what to think about you. And I said, well, man, this is the last night of the revival. You better hold, go ahead and get saved. And I got up and walked off. <laughs> she said, well, I'm going to butt that thing. <laughs> You know, you, you, you just fall in love with God's people wherever you are. That's just the way it is. And it's because God is growing this fruit. And I've seen, you know, if you ever see so, uh, somebody who's tried and convicted for, for, for doing some terrible harm to somebody, killing somebody or something like that, who do you think it's going to be that forgives them? Who's it going to be that, that brings about restoration or, or says that the hearing will judge uh, you know, you can do what you want to, but you don't, you don't have to be harsh in sentencing for revenge on our part because we have come to love the defendant. Who does that? I'll tell you who does it. People that have the Holy Spirit in their life growing those fruit trees of love. Secondly, boy, I said, you know, it's hard for a redneck to preach on love. I'm going to do better with this one. Joy. Joy is the second fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to grow joy in your love. What is the theme song of your life? i got to get a new one. I, you know, for decades I've been illustrating this by saying, Nobody knows. Is that the theme song of your life? The troubles I've seen. Ooh. Or how about this one? If you're 45 and above. Yay for the old people. Amen. Before, that's what I'm talking about. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Oh. Deep, dark, depression, excessive misery. Oh. If it were for bad, low in his church, I'd have no luck at all. Yeah. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Brother, you can't believe it, can you? <laughs> Where am I sitting? Hey man, or if you if you if you come up in the nineties, the song of the year in ninety nine or oh one uh, somewhere along there. I am the man of constant sorrow. Let me get my bluegrass on. I've seen troubles on my head. <laughs> the bluegrass fans are about to throw up right there. I got to come up with a new one. Let it go. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's what I'm talking about. Here ought to be the theme song of the believer's life. I've got a joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart, oh, down in my heart. I've got a joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Sometimes when you sing acapulco, so I had to get Merle to help me out with that. You know, rejoice, man. We're, uh, you know, it, it ought to be fun for a believer. We ought to have joy in our life. And if we don't have a reason to have joy, who does? Man, if there's not going to be joy in the life, of, who said you got to be miserable to be a Christian? Who said you got? Who, who said that misery equates with holiness? Well, I'm close to God. <laughs> And I smiled in 1993. <laughs> it nearly broke my face. <laughs> they ain't gonna try that again. Uh, no, man. We need to have joy in our life. And uh, the Holy Spirit grows that. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I gotta preach on this. I've never preached on this. Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I know you thought it was your looks. <laughs> I know you thought it was your magnanimous mentality. It was the joy of the Lord. And if you don't believe that, find a believer who's in deep, deep trouble and still got a smile on her or his face. Your strength is the joy of the Lord. These things I've written unto you that your joy may be full. Now there are things that will rob you of joy. Look at our next slide. And these are the joy things. Wearsby talks about them in his book, Be Joyful. It's a commentary on Philippians. 
I'm not going to say much about it. But circumstances will rob you of joy. If you're the kind of person that you, you know, if life's good, you're good. And if life's bad, you're bad. You're in trouble. You know, are, are you the kind of person, now I'm going to go ahead and own this one before you get in too bad a shape. Are you the kind of person that just wakes up happier when it's 55 degrees in the morning like it was this morning? <laughs> you know, but you hear, here's a perfect illustration. You know, if you're only going to be happy on days that it's 50 to 65 with 40% humidity and sunny with a 4 mile an hour wind, you're only going to get two of those a year in Louisiana. <laughs> And you ain't going to get to six of them in Oklahoma sometime. I mean, you know, you're not going to have many of those kinds of days. And so if you're a slave to whatever's going on in life, you're never going to, you know, you, you can't be that. You have to let what's inside of you control your state of mind. You have to let what's in here uh, uh, tell you and command to you how good your attitude is going to be. I'm going to be good because Christ is good. He is in me. And the Holy Spirit is growing the fruit of joy in my life. I love what the uh, character in Facing the Giant said. Your attitude is the aroma of your heart. If your attitude stinks, it means your heart is not right. So true. Difficult people. Did you know that some people are so hard to get along with, they will rob you of joy? Do not elbow your spouse at this moment. <laughs> Some people ain't happy unless they stir up trouble. Right. Yeah. Debbie Downers and Debbie Drummers. Yeah, uh, yeah. Danny Downers. <laughs> Sorry about that, dude. Continue, Dan. All right. You know, people, people will rob you of joy. You can't go through life a slave to difficult people on how much they love you or treat you or do you right. You don't need to go through life seeking the approval of others. You need joy in your life because the Holy Spirit is there growing <coughs> joy in your everyday life. Things. I can prove this with one word. It's a hyphenated word and it will prove to you beyond a shadow of doubt that things can rob you of joy. You ready? Weed eater. <laughs> We're here to fool the devil. Amen. I have a hero, man. He shot. He was a 357 man. Man, he had it ruled up in a big hole through it. Man, They're like that is my guy right there. I would love to shoot my weed eater. If I could find it. I lost it. <laughs> Worry. Worry will rob you of joy. Does anybody believe that? Yes. Right, I can move on. Yes. Worry will rob you of joy. It really will. Here's the deal. The adversary says you can't have joy. You're always going to be miserable. You're always going to be depressed. You're always going to live in despair. You're always going to have problems. You're always going to have trouble. Can I tell you today that the Holy Spirit is a professional at growing the fruit of of joy in the believer's heart. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have joy in your life. A third truth, a third fruit is peace. Uh, you know, when you talk about peace, I think about Isaiah's prophecy, prophecy that he will be the prince of peace. Mike, I love this. This one shall be peace. Let me tell you what's going on here. When we think of peace, we think about people who have the ability to bring it. Or people who have the ability to make it. Peacemakers. And that, that's our goal. That's what we can do. And that's the highest to which we can attain. But that's not Jesus. Jesus doesn't have to make peace. He is the peace. Amen. If you have Him in your life, you can have peace. And I believe, and I know I'm narrow-minded, but if you don't have Him, I don't know, man. I'll do better sometimes than others, but I, I don't see real peace coming to you without Jesus. Jesus, He is the peace. I am leaving with you, He says, the gift of peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is the gift the world cannot receive. John 20, the resurrected Jesus told His disciples, Peace be unto you. This world will never see peace until the Prince of Peace comes. That's who He is. Peace is the uh, opposite of fear. It's the opposite of chaos. 
If you're sitting here today and your life is filled with chaos, you, you just you got clutter in your life, you got you, your life is messy. And look, man, I'm not saying that, that happens to all of us. There are times when our lives are messy. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings peace. Can I tell you today that there have been all kinds of times in my life where I've come to places that were not peaceful. There's been stormy times in my life. Stormy times of sickness. Stormy times of tragedy. Lost my sister about a mile and a half from here. About three weeks after I had a bypass surgery. And there have been storms in my life. And we've, we've had family storms just like some of you have had. Uh, there's, there was at least a three month period. And I know it's not very long in a 30 something year career. But there was a time when I was very unhappy in my work. And can I tell you today that in those times of restlessness, in those times of darkness, when you come to the storm, when you come to the valley, you'll never get there. The Lord won't be there first. Well, Dustin used to tell us in uh, Drew Brees' book, Coming Back Stronger, that if He brings you to it, He'll bring you through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because Thou art with me. I don't have to go it alone. God doesn't bring us to the valley and say, all right, then do the best you can and fend for yourself. He picks you up and He carries you to the other side. That's what He does. He grows peace in our lives. We're going to close with our first steps today. If you're here today and you want to receive God's free gift of eternal life, I want to invite you to come. If you're here today and you'd like to become a member of our church, we'd love to have you. We had several got saved and, and several who joined our church in the last service. We, we would love to have you. We invite you to come. Today we've talked about sanctification. We've talked about overcoming that daily battle. We're talking about listening to that good voice in our life. We're talking about growing the fruits of the Spirit. Can I tell you today that I did not intend, and this is not a strategy, to do too more, to work harder, to try harder. You know, that's, that's, that's the impression. The song that you sang, it talked about that. Religion is just another burden. I agree. I agree. Religion can often just be a burden. We're not here to ask you to try harder, to do more. We're here today to ask you to love God. He loved you first. And He loved you more. And if you pursue Him passionately, Pursue the Lord Jesus in your life. The Holy Spirit will grow fruit in your life. And if you need joy, and if you need love and peace, you need to be standing underneath that basket, underneath that tree with that fruit basket, saying, Lord, load me up. I know that my blessings come from you. Lord, here it is. Load me up. Would you do that today? <coughs> Just ask Him to fill your life. Let's all stand together. You feel the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You come. Here today, you'd like to be 